your prophet is sleeping, child. Would you baptize yourself in the blood of midnight and become an infant in his cosmic womb? Todd Kiesling, Doubles Creek. Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm Stephanie, and today I'm joined by Neil McRobert from the Talking Scared podcast, and we are covering the much-requested topic of cult horror. So, Neil, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. This is my first time guesting on someone else's show, so it's it's kind of a bit scary being on this side of the mic. <laughs> I know, right? You feel like you don't have like the control, like you're in the hot seat for the first time. <laughs> yeah, completely. It's like, how much of myself do I show? We are happy to have you on. So tell us a little bit about Talking Scared. Oh, well, what to say? So I, um, first things first, by the way, to apologize, I've got a really bad cough and a really, really thick English accent. So either one could make this quite difficult for people. Um, but yeah, so talking scared i set it up about what eight months ago now um just thinking it would be a tiny little hobby from my from my spare room um to keep me kind of busy during lockdown and and just because of the kindness of 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 writers and publishers and other various people in the industry it's become a bit of a thing so i've got i've got quite big guests um every week i talk to a different horror writer um, I'm trying to avoid the word horror. I might pick the word scared because obviously it's a very broad church. But I, I talked to a different writer who delves into dark matters and I asked him about the, the, the work and the life and the inspirations and and conversations go into quite odd places sometimes. <laughs> but, yeah, the guests are great. I've got I, 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 could, I just spoke to Josh Malaman, who was a delight. I'm speaking to Joel Lansdale soon, to Ramsey Campbell. I've got Peter Straub. As I'm telling everyone, as as <laughs> agreed to come on the show for a Christmas special, um, as I always say, I'm, I'm essentially crawling my way piece by piece, person by person, towards Stephen King. And that then, when I've spoken to him, I will close my laptop forever and <laughs> go into the West. Like I have completed my mission. I'm just done. That's awesome, though. Those are some big names. That's awesome. It never gets any less nerve wracking. I spoke to right. Tanara Reeve do a few weeks ago, and I was just terrified. Oh, I know that. There's there's like a few. Well, I think most of my author interviews, like before we record, I am like pacing around my room and I'm like, I'm like double checking the email they gave me, like just to make sure it works. And I'm just like, all right, we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the continual terror that the technology will let you down when you're talking to one of your heroes. Um, it's a bit nerve wracking. But I should just say before we go on, by the way, just going to say, because I know you had a massive... Um, um, benchmark recently you've turned 30 and you've got your massive quarter mil downloads i want to just say that this show is one of the inspirations for talking scared because i was listening to books in the freezer three four years ago in a job that i hated and i'm thinking you know could i do this maybe one day so this feels a little, little bit like coming full circle so thank you very much for doing what you do oh that is so awesome glad that it served as an inspiration and helped you through a, a crappy job i've got i've been there <laughs> So today we are talking about cult horror. So in your opinion, what do you think works about cult horror? Well, I mean, I grew up as somebody whose only real experience of cult horror was The Wicker Man, and it always seemed a little bit otherworldly. And then in more recent years, I I listened to a lot of weird podcasts about, you know, creepy stuff and the paranormal and and conspiracy theories. And and I've gone down a bit of a... um, a deep dive into various cults and and they've become more real to me i think and i think the horror about them has become more real um and i think i mean we'll talk about some of these books today but in a, in a world which is coming increasingly tribal and increasingly echo chambered um i think cult horror really works by showing us how easy it is to fall into these controlling 
societies and these ways of th- these ways of thinking where you actually lose your grip on, on on reality and you lose perspective and before you know it you're isolated and you only believe what you're told and and then you get Donald Trump yeah I mean it's it's horrifying and as I was telling you before we recorded and I've mentioned a few times on the podcast I don't really like get into the specifics but I grew up in what I would call an evangelical cult <laughs> and it was essentially like evangelicalism but pushed to the extreme like the women were not allowed to wear pants we wore like dresses and skirts that had to go below our knees our shirts had to be like two fingers below the collarbone shoulders could never be shown like you were not allowed to have physical contact with members of the opposite sex it was very strict like the church was very isolating and tried to host things for big holiday events to kind of keep you from seeing your family and just like you know if anyone tells you that you know what's going on here is wrong like it's just because like they don't have Jesus you know that special knowledge that like they just don't understand they're worldly they're bad like it was just and I'm still very much like working through disentangling a lot of the stuff from where I grew up. So cult horror for me, I think, hits very close to home, (laughs) bringing a lot of my personal experience. A little bit triggering, yeah. Yeah. And and I just think it's, I think it's crazy, like, with with cult horror. Well, no, forget horror, with cults. I I just think it's crazy how much we, you know, they're just so obviously manifestations of, of male control like you you never get like a cult I mean, I mean, no, you know what i'm sure you do i'm sure you do but <laughs> they, they always seem to be led by men who would otherwise be virgins who you know and, and it's always about owning women and covering women and coveting women and it, it's always just the same stuff and it's always just like mate just if this guy just like made a friend and someone spoke to me we went to a bar at a time he wouldn't feel the need to be a cult leader you know, and um, yeah, yeah. I, I just think it's it, it's so funny. How they always go down the same line. There's always the same narrative in the end. Thankfully, yeah. the books are at least a bit more varied. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, except if we're talking about the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man, where it's like the matriarchal society. <laughs> good point. Yeah. Yeah. Although that that is the only good good innovation about it. <laughs> Yeah, one of the podcasts I started listening to is Cult Podcast, and uh, they get into, and you know, they have a running joke that with cult leaders, it's like, yeah, God spoke to me, and he definitely wants me to have sex with your wife. Like, it always is. <laughs> that did not go on in the in the church that I was raised in, but uh, it's just a funny through line that you definitely see <laughs> when you study, you know, big infamous cults, I think. And yeah, I think what's scary is that the thing with cults is they know how to prey on people you know when it's the emotional or you know when christian looks at her and he asks her do you feel held by him and it's very you know he knows what she is missing from her life and when she has that emotional breakdown that she doesn't know has all been orchestrated and she has all the women that are there crying with her and feeling her pain with her and this is the first time that anyone has acknowledged her pain and let her feel her feelings and like they know this it's just so sinister well it is sinister but midsummer is an interest now i've only seen midsummer once uh, and I, I loved it. I'm one of these people who I hated hereditary, just didn't find it scary. It left me cold. We're the opposite. So went into mid- <laughs> oh, well, there you go. I went into Midsummer like expecting to just be like, this is pretentious nonsense. And I was just blown away by it because I, I, I love daylight horror as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I watched Midsummer and I came out a little bit confused because I was like, OK, so it's it's a horror film about a cult. But as far as I can see, Danny leaves that film in a far better position than she goes into it. So it doesn't... I'm always like, it, it's a film in which being a member of a cult seems a, a relatively positive move. That's what I think is scary about it. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is that element. <laughs> it, yeah, but like, I mean, but I remember watching, yeah, just being like, I was waiting for the bad thing to... I mean, sorry, no spoilers here, but I was waiting for further bad things to happen that do happen. And when they didn't, I was like, oh, okay, well, clearly she made the right move. 
she gets to live in Sweden, and it's very pretty. Yeah. I mean, except she does have to die when she turns, like, 75. Well, <laughs> at, least, at least it's a cool way to die. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 that is a hell of a scene. It was funny. I remember watching that with my sister, and she's like, what is happening? What are they doing? And I'm like, what do you think that's going to happen? And she's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, exactly, exactly where you think this is going? <laughs> mm-hmm. And you just think, oh, they won't show it to us. They won't. Oh, and they, 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 they really show it to you. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, for, for me, for me, I mean, there's loads of cool cult films, but being English, well, British rather, um, The Wicker Man, like the original Wicker Man, like it, it, it's one of those films, I would say The Exorcist and and like one of the books I'm going to talk about where it feels like evil is is burnt into the celluloid. Like, I remember watching it, I really viscerally, viscerally remember watching it and on a New Year's Eve when I would have been about 13 and my parents let me watch it. And, and when you get the end and you know, and, and you realise, just like we said, that, oh, that's going to happen. That thing is actually going to happen. It's one of the most traumatic moments in film I've ever seen. Like the empathy I had, you can feel the terror. I just, I find it one of the scariest films I've ever seen. Well, I have a few cult films that I like because I feel like they understand certain aspects of cults. Like, did you watch The Invitation? Yes, I did watch The Invitation. That's with the house, with the party that they yeah, the dinner party, entirely different. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's, you know, essentially this cult that's preying on people who have lost someone or who are grieving and are really speaking to that part of them and filling that need. And in this case, you know, just telling them not to feel pain, that feeling pain is a choice and you can just bulldoze past it and join our cult and we have the answers. Um, and another film I really liked that I watched recently for the first time was The Endless. Yeah. Yes. I watched this recently. Um and I, I, I really, I find that it's a se- That's actually a sequel. That film. I didn't know this. It's a sequel to a to a, a earlier film, right? Or yes, it's like I heard linked that. in some way to an earlier film. Yes. Yeah, I haven't seen the, I haven't <laughs> seen the first film. Um, Me neither. But, but that's great. <laughs> well, too many films, too much, too little time. Even with lockdown, there's too many films and too little time. Um, but yeah, that is a great film, and that. I, I keep kind of like burying the lead here, but that that is for me tonally very similar to one of the books on my list uh, that I'm going to talk about today. But but again, it's that sense of you know being drawn back into this evil, maybe a strong word, but into this situation and being no matter even if you escape from the cult, you never really escape. I found it quite a pretty chilling proposition. Yeah, well, I I liked it because it was the two brothers and the one older brother you know yanked his little brother out and out in the real world they're having a hard time and the younger brother you know not really understanding just has very positive memories of this communal living and the older brother has like a very black and white like no it was a cult I saved you I got you out and the brother's like you know all I know is when I was there like we had food we had shelter we had friends you took me out and now we have nothing so I think just that very interesting dynamic of people's different experiences and how they process that was fascinating to me (laughs) yeah very much what i would add to the list so we're just riffing on films now but um one of the most frankly horrifying things i've ever seen is a, a film called the sacrament have you seen this no it's a it's a found footage film that came right at the end of the found footage wave when everyone was tired of it um and it's weird because it, it takes the premise that you are watching these um, these journalists from Vice, and it's all branded like as if Vice made the film, but they they didn't. Anyway, and and they go to a cult, and and essentially there's nothing clever about it. It's just a reenactment of what happened at Jonestown. So if you know what happened at Jonestown, spoiler alert. Um, but yeah, like they're just there, and they get increasingly exposed to the the final days of this cult and then it's just shot and nothing pulls away and it's just like you're there at the end of a suicide cult and it's horrifying just because it's so mundane yeah it's the sacrament i think it's by ty west who made house of the devil and it's it's the last thing that i think he made that i saw but it's great 
Well, one of my books very much mirrors the Jonestown. I mean, Jonestown is like one of the most infamous cults. So I think a lot of works of film and literature are are definitely based like on that specific. Yeah, cult. yeah. It's kind of hard to get away from it because it just has the worst possible outcome. Oh yeah. But one thing I was thinking about is one of my most anticipated uh, books coming out this year that is not horror, just not fiction at all, but it's from uh, Amanda Montel, who is a linguist, and she's coming out with a book this year called Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism. And she, in the book, is going to break down kind of the language that different cults use, but she's really getting into even like the things that people lightheartedly refer to as cults, you know, like Peloton, improv. <laughs> crossfit you know mlms the things that you know they use to bring in new members and foster this sense of community and like staying with us and you know what is special about us that other people don't have like when you're with us you have this special thing and i'm so excited to read it yeah it sounds good i mean I, i'm convinced that crossfit are up to no good and that we <laughs> are doing weird things in those boxes <laughs> I'm convinced it's not right and should be stopped. What are they training for? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm a runner, and you could argue that we, we joke that my local running club in this small town that I live in, this tiny village, um, it's a village of about a 1,000 people, and 300 of them are in the running club, and everyone oh, wow. jokes that we're a cult. Yeah, and, and we use sort of cultish tactics, I suppose. You can sort of see how we do it. Um, but, yeah, what are CrossFit training for? What they, Someone needs to keep an eye on CrossFit. We need, we need an insider in those gyms. I don't trust them. Yeah, where's the Vice documentary on CrossFit? Indeed. Indeed. It needs to happen. The next that'll be the next Netflix documentary that kind of goes viral. <laughs> I'll be waiting for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm excited about that. And then I know with the political stuff and the rise of QAnon, um, Colin Dickey, um, who wrote Ghostland and um I forget what the book was called, but it was very much getting into. Shoot. It's called the. It's called. He came on my show to talk about it. It's called the Unidentified. That's it. Yeah. So he's working on a book right now about like you know the cults and conspiracies. So it's it's something that's on the mind of a lot of people right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it is. I think more than ever we're realizing that we're all being um occulted shall we say we're all being trapped into certain ways of thinking that we don't question even if it's you know without getting into the whole left and right thing because i'm a complete bleeding heart liberal lefty even i sometimes look at my own liberal peers and go like come on you know there are other ways to think now and again about you know certain topics you can accommodate other ways of thinking it does it does get a little bit culty sometimes mm -hmm. well are we ready to get into the books I am. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good to go. All right. Well, the first book I'm talking about is one I talked about pretty recently, but it is Within These Walls by Anya Alborn. And this follows washed up true crime writer Lucas Graham, who moves his daughter across the country after a rocky divorce because he is promised full access to Jeffrey Combs, a notorious cult leader and death row inmate. As part of the deal with Combs, he moves into the home that was the scene of the crime. Which is totally fine, totally normal, no red flags about that. And then as soon as he settled, Combs reneges on the deal, and he's left to put the pieces of the story together alone. But is he really alone? Uh, what I liked about this is that this is a dual timeline, so you're going back and forth between present day, and you're following Lucas and his daughter living in this crime scene house, um, and then 30 years ago where the cult leader character is introduced, and we see how he and his group came to live in the home. And I think the cult aspect that's interesting about this story is how this person that lived in this house was very vulnerable and was selected. And part of the story is very much like the seduction process, I guess, into a cult, but how they ingratiate themselves into people and, you know, the love bombing tactics and stuff. And you can see how someone who is in a vulnerable state or is lonely can fall prey to you know this sudden onslaught of attention and friendship and you know these relationships for the first time in their life or especially at this vulnerable time in their life you kind of see it firsthand happening in that timeline yeah i just think the horror of literally 
watching someone be groomed into a cult and into doing something horrific by the end of their story. Just a lot of emotional manipulation. And I think from the outside, you can see why the person is a target for the group. In this case, you know, she was living alone in this giant house. She had money. She was connected to people in power. Um, but she was a target because she was lonely and needed human attention. And I think that part of the cult experience is super fascinating. And then, of course, you have the present day, like the writer putting documents and things together. And then his daughter is going off and kind of figuring out things on her own. And just all of it comes together to make this like really creepy story. Uh, Rating wise, I'm putting it in the fridge. There's some legitimately eerie scenes. But I think the part that creeps me out the most is just seeing that grooming process just watching someone be groomed into a cult so that is within these walls by anya alborn well well, i mean that sounds pretty interesting because i'm trying to think now and i can't think of many novels that actually deals with the grooming process normally the stories about people trying to escape from or looking back on horrible things that have happened like i'm i'm there's Oh, I spoke to Courtney Summers recently about her book, The Project, and and that kind of goes into some degree about the grooming pro, pro uh, the grooming process itself. But yeah, otherwise I can't really think about how it having it really depicted how it happened. So that yeah, it does sound creepy. Can I ask, is that a? I haven't read it. Is that a one of um, Anya Alborn Alborn's um, YA, or is it one of her adult novels? I think it's adult. Because I, I I've only read her YA stuff, which is is still pretty pretty freaky. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that one sounds that one sounds good. Yeah, I I really like it. I think it's one of my favorite ones of hers. So my pick, I kind of stole from you because you also wanted to talk about this one, and I I cheekily took guess right and and demanded it. So I apologize. You're fine. Um, <laughs> My my first pick is a book from last year. It's The Children of Red Peak by Craig DeLewy, which is, I think, quite an odd little book because it's it's marketed as horror very much so. And it is, but but not in the way you probably expect it to be from the synopsis. It, it's about, well, it's about four young people who have escaped from a a, a suicide cult or, or I suppose survived the aftermath of a suicide cult um, who for various reasons are called back to the site of the cult's end which is the the eponymous uh, sorry titular Red Peak um, and they they one of their fellow ex-devotees commits suicide um, and they decide to reunite share stories and these repressed memories surface and they decide to go back to try and really come to terms with what happened on that final night at Red Peak. Now, that sounds, I'd I'd never read anything by Craig DeLue before I read it. Um, Craig came on the show to discuss it. I was very grateful. That sounds to me like a really, you know, your absolute textbook cult narrative, but it's completely not. It, it's very, very, um, it's a massive slow burn. They they don't really go back to Red Peak until probably the last quarter at, at the most of the novel. Um, the the vast majority of it is them going through their everyday lives really, and and it, it's a kind of a character study in in three parts of how these young people have learned to survive and cope with the trauma of what they've been through, and and they all find different ways. To cope one becomes a um i can't think of the name for the job but he becomes one of these people who kind of th- therapizes people who've come out of the cult there is a name oh, yeah. for it um, a deprogrammer well, deprogramming sorry that's it yeah he becomes a deprogrammer um one becomes a, a you know an executive with a very high powered job uh, and another becomes a musician and but they're all coping strategies and, and deep in them they've got this this kernel of trauma that's still there and there's a few things I loved about it. One, there's this sense of just inevitabil- inevitability that I really appreciate. It just feels like the novel is not hurtling, but kind of crawling and shambling towards this inescapable horror that is in the past of the revelation of what happened. 
Um, it's as I said, it's really focused on the interior lives of these these people rather than rather than the grimness of what went on. It's much what actually happened is kind of alluded to more than reveled in. So it's not exploitative. But when you find out what has happened, it, it is it is awful. Um, and I like that it, it's there's nothing to do with the horror actually, but it contains some of the best writing about music and performance that I've I've ever read. Like when I was going to my kindle, I was endlessly just like highlighting passages. So one of the survivors, Deacon, he's kind of like the wild child who who copes by throwing himself into hedonism rather than control. And he turns to music. He's in a band. And he's full of sentences like this, if you'll indulge me. He says that like he's performing and he says that, you know, quote, together with the rest of the band, he was hacking brains, triggering oxy- oxytocin and adrenaline, inviting the audience to join an infinite flow, chasing the euphoric catharsis of falling in love whilst dying. And I think that is just like that is exactly the heart of what live music does to us. And I think it that's that's but it also triggers goes into this transcendental nature of of what actually happens to the cult and that's where it starts to err towards cosmic horror what actually happened to them um it's transcendental and it's cosmic and i'm not a fan of cosmic horror per se but it's done really well really yeah. well in this novel uh, and i think lastly it pairs really well as i was saying before with the film you mentioned the endless it has yeah. that similar feel of how people who, who have left the cult cope and why they go back. So yeah, the uh, the Children of Red Peak by Craig D. Lewis. It's it's very different to most horror novels you read, and it's it's a slow burn, and it's clever, and it's character focused. And I I'd probably put it just about in the fridge. It could have been room temperature because there's not much actual horror, but I think the events that we find out have occurred, even though we aren't shown them firsthand. They they're pretty grisly, and I think you know. For someone who may, as yourself, have you know been in, in a situation anything like this, it, it could be quite triggering. Yeah, it was a, it was a book I, much like the endless, was like, yeah, this is what it's like, <laughs> all of these different conflicting emotions, and I still, you know, keep in touch with a lot of the people I grew up with, and all of us are out, you know, and it's interesting to see within our group, you know how all of us deal and compartmentalize that experience. And I think that's what I enjoyed about the book is that you really go through all of these different people and them having to deal with these complicated feelings. Like, how do I deal with, you know, loving my parents who put me through this, but at the same time understanding that they themselves were being manipulated, (laughs) you know, in these very big complicated not easy to answer questions yeah it's a very empathetic book it doesn't even the people who are doing some of the horrible stuff they're never really villains are they you know even the head of the cult is is a well-intentioned if very flawed man yes it was just i thought like i gave it five stars and i don't give out five stars too easily (laughs) But it was a book that made me feel very seen, not because the church I grew up with uh, was being manned by a cosmic <laughs> force in any way. But I felt like just the the portrayal of everyone and like you said, the empathetic way that it, it portrays everyone. And it, it is very character focused. Mm. Yeah. And, um, it reminded me a little bit of a Stephen King novel where it, it goes off on quite sort of almost pointlessly meandering character <laughs> building stuff but actually you realize in the end it isn't pointless it's given a whole texture to the world you're reading about yeah it's great mm-hmm. uh well if i want to go on to my book that pairs but i would say tonally a little bit different leans hard into the horror <laughs> I'm going to go with Devil's Creek by Todd Kiesling. When I tell you about this, they're going to sound very similar, but I'm telling you they're they're pretty different. I'm going to read the synopsis. Uh, so about 15 miles west of Stoford, Kentucky, lies Devil's Creek. According to local legend, there used to be a church out there, home to the Lord's Church of Holy Voices, a death cult where Jacob Masters preached the gospel of a nameless God. And like most legends, there's truth buried among the roots and bones. In 1983, the church burned to the ground following a mass suicide. Among the survivors were Jacob's six children and their grandparents, who banded together to defy the former minister. 
Dubbed the Stouffer's Six, these children grew up amid scrutiny and ridicule, but their infamy has faded over the last 30 years. Now their ordeal is all forgotten, and Jacob Masters is nothing more than a scary story told around campfires. For Jack Tremley, one of the six, memories of that fateful night have fueled a successful art career and a lifetime of nightmares. When his grandmother Imogene dies, Jack returns to Stouffer to settle her estate. When he finds waiting for him are secrets that Imogene kept in his youth. Secrets about his father and the church. Secrets that can no longer stay buried. (laughs) So as I was saying... Uh, this book does follow the six survivors of the cult and you know it very much was a a cult leader slept with all these women and so these are all half siblings (laughs) that survived so it's interesting when Jack the main character comes back because he has like five half siblings that also have this traumatic experience that he is also related to in this very odd strange way and they have to acknowledge that like their literal father was the person behind this horrible thing that happened. So it's like even more of a crazy experience. Um, But while Children of Red Peak was a slow burn character study, this is a long book and it's very epic, but it starts off right away with like the grandparents going to go get their grandchildren back, like armed confrontation goes bloody like first chapter. (laughs) Like you start off with a bang and then from there the horror coming back and resurging and taking over this town and taking over everybody is just nonstop merciless. Um, This is like I said very epic. You're kind of following a bunch of different point of views within this town. So you're following Jack who was the artist who's come home. You're following uh, Stevie, who is his half sister, who's like a DJ at a local station who plays like evil rock, like metal music. And she's kind of like taken that on as an identity. Like they really lean into like, ooh, yeah, we're the evil, <laughs> like the evil rock station. Um, like one of the siblings has become a pastor and has a teen son who, you know, is having a hard time dealing with all of this. And then all of a sudden his life gets turned upside down when this you no know, supernatural evil <laughs> comes back and takes over the town. Um, but I thought this did a very good job of building dread. And it's really good for readers who want a big a bird's eye epic story where you're following many characters through a town and tying those threads together. And I will say one thing that I think he got right when it comes to cult story is the religious jargon, like spiritual talk that people have, like when they're talking about the cult or talking about being in church, I thought was done very well. Um, This is a big book. I forget how many pages it is, but it's, I want to say like over around 500. I am putting it in the colder part of the fridge. There were some scary parts uh, when the religious terror starts to to kick up a notch. That was Devil's Creek by Todd Kiesling. So I haven't read this book, but it's it's right at the top of my want to read list. Unfortunately, because I interview a, a different person every week, yeah. I have no time to read books for people who aren't on the show. Um so I'm now at the point where I'm, I'm inviting people onto the show because I want to read the book. I need an excuse. Um, so I'm going to have to get Todd on the show because everything you said sounds like he's written this book for me. So I, I, I love coming of age horror about adolescence. I think it sounds really cool that the grandparents are kind of characters too. That sounds really cool. Um, you know, I, I do. I love like the big, as you say, bird's eye epic stuff. Like it, it, it sounds like he's written it for me. So I... Yeah, I, I really, really want to read this one. It's got a great cover too. The cover's so atmospheric yeah. and like, pulls you in. Yeah, yeah. Really I'm sorry good. I can't talk to you more about it because I wish I'd read it because I just <laughs> it sounds like it sounds so good, but I, I've got nothing to say. Annoyingly, no, you're totally fine. I mean, it's also a giant book, so if you don't have some time to carve out, like, it's just. And I totally understand that. There's definitely topics that I do, and I'm like, oh, good. I can finally read this book that's been on my TBR forever because I have an episode on this coming up. So I get that. (laughs) Yeah, but you have permission. Yeah. Yeah. No, that does sound, that sounds like exactly my kind of thing, though. Yeah. Big epic horror. We need more big epic horror. Everything's gone slimline. I want more big books. 
So my next pick is a book that scared me. It's probably probably in the top five books that have scared me the most in my life. Um, it's called Last Days by Adam Neville, not to be confused by Last Days by Brian Evanson. Uh, this is by the British author Adam Neville, who, for people who don't know, wrote um, the ritual that the Netflix horror film was based on. Um, so I think I'll, I'll read the synopsis because it, it gives a better precy than I could. And it's been a while since I've read it as well, so it's probably best I rely on Amazon synopsis <laughs> rather than my own memory. Um, so the Temple of the Last Days, the brutal cult with a history of murder, sex and occult dealings, destroyed itself during one night of ritualistic violence decades ago, or so they thought. Kyle Freeman is an indie filmmaker with no money and few options. So when he lands a commission to make a documentary about the Temple of the Last Days, he jumps at the chance. Little does he know that his investigation into the cult's bloody history will lead him to vi- lead him into the darkest places he's ever been. As they travel from London and France to Arizona, tracing the path of the cult, uncanny events, out-of-body experiences, ghastly artifacts, and visits by the merciless old friends, plague Kyle and his one-man crew, they soon discover the power of the cult's terrible legacy, and then it may be too late for them to escape. Forgive him, just drinking. Adam Neville's books get under my skin like nothing else. Um, I can't really say why. It's kind of inarticulatable. Um, but like something like The Exorcist, as I said, he's, they, it feels like these books have got some horror kind of baked into them. Uh, and this one is arguably his scariest vice for the, for the top spot. Um, why do I love it? So first of all, it's it's a really dirty book. It feels nasty and gross and infected. So Kyle travels around these sites where the cult have been and he finds like absolute squalor and deprivation. It's really tactile, um, really awful. And it, it gives the sense of like, you know, the, the, the desperation of these people's last days. There's, there's no grandeur or glamour left to this. Oh, it's horrible. Uh, which I believe when you read about things like Jonestown or Ormshan Riccio, is true people live in in vile conditions but you can really feel it um it plays with the nature of found footage which is something i love in fiction because it, it goes back to the very origins of horror and the gothic with these kind of found manuscripts and all that kind of stuff like it the the, the, the kyle is a documentary filmmaker and he's going around piecing together a story so it feels like the blair witch in which a lot of the book is kind of him talking to people and being told stories so that it's kind of a cool way to get the exposition over. But it feels like the Blair Witch with that supernatural slowly bleeding into reality for the protagonist and then potentially for us as the reader. And it, it has that feeling of being like based on real events, but it, it's not. I've tried to research it. There's no truth in it. But it feels <laughs> like, the, like there is or there should be. You know what I mean? Um, I will say it's been criticised, I believe, wrongly. Um, for two reasons. One, people say it's repetitive uh, because Kyle visits a site, he talks to someone, he finds something weird, he sees evidence of kind of demonic presence and then gets freaked out that night when said demonic presence kind of shows an interest in him and then it's on to the next site. But for me, that it's not repetition. It's more like this sensation of a, like a clenching fist like things are getting tighter and more claustrophobic around him. Um, and each time something happens, it's more heightened than the last. So I think it's it's a formal device rather than a lack of imagination on the author's part. He's choosing to do this, this rep- repetitive thing where each time it's a little bit worse. Uh, and other people have said that the end of the book, again, it's a very big book. It's about five or six pages and it's, it's a slow burn. And then people say it goes to action packed at the end. But I kind of think like, you know, it's a slow burn book. It kind of earns an action packed ending. And I also think it's nice once in a while to see a horror novel just kind of go, oh, screw it and throw <laughs> blood and guts and action at you. You know, something, that's not a bad thing to like for it to get, you know, really gross and violent at the end. It's a horror book and, and, and I, I, it works for me, you know, make your own mind up, but it works for me. And I will say that the old friends mentioned in the synopsis, the, these evil entities, I'm not going to say too much about them, but they are some of the most 
frightening supernatural creatures I've ever read about. Um, they're awful. And, and a lot of the book involves invasion and attack by them during the night, which is a it's kind of a particular trigger point for me psychologically. So so I would put this definitely in the freezer. It genuinely scared me. Oh, wow. Freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't read any Adam Neville, but I did love the ritual movie. That creeped me out. <laughs> Weirdly, the, he's most known for that book, and I think it's by far his weakest novel. I think the movie is better than the book. Everything else he's written is great. He's got This is Amazing and a book called Apartment 16, which is, for me, the most frightening depiction of... Um, sort of mental illness and schizophrenia and psychosis I've ever read. It, it, it really disturbed me. He he does something to me that, that I think it's personal to me. He gets under my skin in a way that very, very few people do. Interesting. Yeah. What was the name of it again? The book, sorry, it's called Last Days. All right. I will be moving on to my final pick. Uh, I did want to say I asked my Patreon supporters about what kind of cult horror novels they enjoy. And I did have uh, John Thompson who said uh, Brian Evanson's Last Days. And I love the way he described it. He said, basically, Clive Barker writing a Coen Brothers movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I did read Last Days. And that is an interesting way to describe it. I'm like, okay, I see that. <laughs> I see that a little bit, a little bit of a amputation cult. Also, I feel like there's a lot of stories about amputation cults. I'm like, why amputation? I haven't read one, but that, that sounds like think... it's probably tying into some kind of weird thing that people have. Yeah. Cause I guess I'm thinking of that and geek love. I'm like, those are very specific Oh, of course, Geek Love. Yeah, I forgot all about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, right, I have a thing about Geek Love. Someone recommended Geek Love on my podcast the other day. Clay McLeod Chapman recommended mm -hmm. that as his book for my listeners to read. I, I, I always thought that Geek Love was just just a book that people at university read, and and more and more people I know mentioning Geek Love to me. I think it's just a thing in Britain. I just think people don't know about it. But yeah, everyone should read Geek Love. Oh, definitely. I talked about it on my. Uh all-time favorites episode it's up there <laughs> yeah well quite right it's a great book but my last pick um i am going with little heaven by nick cutter this is a dual timeline story in 1980 and 1966 it has a little bit of a western feel like we're following a trio of mercenaries who are tasked with res with uh, rescuing a boy from a religious compound in the woods in New Mexico. And when they make their way there, they realize they are not alone in the woods. I mean, and that's aside from the horrors of living in the religious compound and the, the strict setup of the days and the isolation and the fanaticism, you know, within this cult. And this is the one that is very Jonestown adjacent. I would say down to the way the cult leader is described. Like he's wearing like aviator glasses. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, in the future timeline, when one of the trio, Micah's daughter, gets abducted, they know what they have to do. So I think the horror of this works because Nick Cutter, I would say if there's one thing he does well, which is a lot, but one thing that he excels at, I think, is body horror. Like, I think most people know him for the troop, which is, like, body horror up to 11. Um, and I found the religious cult super interesting. There is a lot of horrific scenes, but the book is a little bit of a slow burn. And I like that we focus on these characters' backstories and relationships through each other with these timelines. And a lot of them have their own different traumas that they are bringing into this experience. And some of them, you know, that they specifically have to face and work through throughout the novel. I love a good uh, character-driven story of people like working through their trauma. And it does have a bit of a monstrous supernatural angle. And I liked this. I read this a few years ago, but I remember 
that I was sitting like at my kitchen table reading the book and like my cat jumped on the table and just what I was reading, it gave me the biggest fright I have ever had. I almost like jumped out of my seat and fell on the ground because I was like, it was a very scary part when she jumped in and just scared the crap out of me. Uh, so I'm putting this in the fridge, I think, for the body horror scenes in this book. And that is Little Heaven by Nick Cutter. I'm really embarrassed because I claim to be a horror expert. And this is the third book of you that I haven't read. Um, again, it's been on my list for, well, since it came out, because I, I love weird westerns. Um, and I love the troupe and basically I have no excuse for not having read it um, but yeah I mean as you say no one does body horror like Nick Cutter um, so the th- I mean one of my favorite things about cult horror movies is that thing where there's always some horrible scene where you know they have some barbaric punishment that they do to somebody then you kind of work out what it is and you're like wincing um, so I imagine Nick Cutter being unleashed on that that kind of trope would be would be quite the thing uh, but yeah i really need to read this one i really do yeah well once again i'll get nick on the show and then i've got permission to read his book so that that's what will have to happen yeah oh that's right no, yeah. It sounds, yeah it sounds great it's i like the um i like the fact that the guy is wearing aviators too that that made me laugh <laughs> My last pick is a, I, I, I'll be honest, I almost feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about this book. That's how horrific it is. It's a book called Gather the Daughters by Jenny Malamed. Melamed. Jenny Melamed. Apologies. Have you read this by any chance? I don't know. Because of the way I grew up, I really avoid uh religious cults about like women being oppressed like I still can't I can't watch The Handmaid's Tale not because like my experience mirrors that in any like literal way but there's just little aspects of it that I'm like Ugh. so anyway no <laughs> this is when I started reading and I'm like uh, uh, I don't know how I feel <laughs> yeah it's it's a book that I almost feel a little bit uncomfortable um recommending it because recommending is a strong word i it's a brilliant book but kind of tread carefully um again i I will read the synopsis because it's really tricky not to give too many spoilers away so on a small isolated island there is a community that lives by its own rules boys grow up knowing they will one day take charge while girls know that they will be married and pregnant within months of hitting womanhood But before that time comes, a ritual offers children an exhilarating reprieve. Every summer they are turned out onto their doorsteps to roam the island, sleep on the beach and build camps in trees to be free. At the end of one such summer, one of the younger girls sees something she was never supposed to see. And she returns home with a truth that could bring the island world to its knees. So there's no getting around it. It's a book that is about sexual abuse in the worst way um it's it's in no way exploitative at all but it is truly awful i I mean i felt like i needed a bath after reading it you know um so you mentioned handmaid's tale and and lots of people compare this to tammy tale remember a few years ago there was this kind of trend where there seems to be loads of feminist dystopian fiction there was like vox and there was the power and there were there were other books that came out, and they all just got compared to to um, Handmaid's Tale. Well, Gather the Daughters definitely has traces of that, but I would say that comparing it to Margaret Atwood's book is like comparing the film Martyrs with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, you know, Martyrs couldn't probably exist without the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it goes so much further, and it's so much worse. Um, so a comparison is kind of reductive. It, it, it takes place kind of 10 minutes in the future in this world where we know something has happened on the mainland. We don't really know what. It's a bit like um, Shyamalan's The Village, that, that movie. Um, and I'm going to tread carefully. Everyone, the, the, the stuff you know going in is that everyone on the island can have two children. And after they, they grow up, you kill yourself um so so far so midsummer um 
and then when a girl begins menstruating which is called and it makes me feel it's sickly even saying it it's called her summer of fruition she she is gathered hence the title and married off to a much older man but until then she's allowed to run around and have this amazing carefree summer or what you think is this carefree summer and it seems like a youthful paradise you know if it wasn't for the 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 marriage coming down the down the line um but it seems like okay but then you find out that the reality is something so much darker uh, and, I, and i won't say what because that is the reveal um the author does an amazing job of kind of balancing knowledge so you always know a little bit more than the protagonist well there are four protagonists and you always know a little bit more than them you've always got this dramatic irony um but when the truth comes out you're still blown away it's horrific um and the, the worst thing and this is as close as i can get with, without spoiling it is that people are still coming from the mainland to join this community and then one, once you know what the real rules of this island are that's the truly horrific part that people are still choosing to be, to, to become a member that it's it's a novel which is horrific in its implications uh, and it, it, it's well it follows four it's well structured it follows these four young girls who each rebel in their own way like one stops eating one learns to kind of actually learns to speak to argue back and and one reads and that becomes incredibly important the fact that she reads um what else to say about it a lot of people criticize its ending and they say that it, it they criticize they say it's anticlimactic or that it's immoral because it lets certain people get away with certain things i disagree entirely i think it is it's actually very clever in the ending i think it's it's making an immoral point for moral reasons um but you have to kind of read between the lines i can't really say too much more the, the one thing i would say about it is i do wonder if there's this weird um double standard because lots of women reviewers who've read this book don't really dwell on on the, the the things that are truly horrific and i do wonder if if um it appalled me more because of my own ignorance in a way so i wonder if women read this book and go yeah that's just a grandiose kind of parody for you know a woman's lived existence it's just taking what we all go through and making it you know so extreme whereas i'm male and stupidly entitled enough to actually be shocked by this you know that that's what i felt all the way through that maybe it's revealing how much i'm unaware of how awful stuff is for some women in reality if, if that makes sense i would put this at the very back of the freezer with oh, the stuff wow. that you're keeping for the next pandemic you know what i mean <laughs> with all the stuff you're saving like it's unforgettable in its depravity i would say oh yeah I mean, I couldn't even finish this. I read this. I started to read this the year it came out, and I was like, "Yeah, no, I don't think I'm gonna gonna be able to do this." Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to put anyone off reading it. I don't want I don't want people to go into this thinking it's something like Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door, where you're no. reading these horrendous accounts. It's not that. As, as I say, it's by implication. Um, there is no exploitative prose. There's no grim, visceral torture porn. It's just in much the way that the handmaid's tale is it's an implication about society that is just so much worse than 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 you know going in but yeah tread carefully yeah yeah just because i i mean and the reason i didn't want to read it was because of the lived experience i'm bringing to it so the, most people would probably be able to handle it just fine i mean the handmaid's tale is like a best like a very successful show so a lot of people can watch it and consume that and be uh, so what was the title again? Sorry. It's called Gather the Daughters by Jenny Melamed. Are we ready to talk about some chilling obsessions? <laughs> yes, we are. I'm, I'm going to use this to uh, platform some stuff I really love. Yeah, go for it. So I've got I've got four things, but I'll try not to take up too much time. I, I, I've gone for things in different mediums. Um, so, first of all, a film that I've been watching repeatedly during the pandemic, which I'm amazed that the world is not talking about. It's a film called The Platform on Netflix. Um, it's a 
it's either a Spanish film or a, a Spanish language film. I'm not sure which. Um, have you seen it? The platform? No, I've seen it on Netflix. Like I've definitely scrolled past it. <laughs> I can't believe more people aren't watching it. So it's this amazing, um, almost metaphorical, surrealist science fiction nightmare um, in which a man wakes up and he's in a bare room. There's like an absolute concrete cell with one other person in the room who he doesn't know. And in the middle of the room is a massive hole. And when he looks down through the hole, there's a room beneath him and a room beneath that and a room beneath that. And he realizes he's in this almost impossibly tall tower block. It's like 400 stories high and they've got nothing. They've got, they've got no resources. And then one, a, a certain time of the day, a platform comes down through all the holes and it contains food and it stays at their level for like a minute and they can eat as much food as they want in that minute. But by the time it gets to the bottom, of course, there is no food left and then and every sort of few days they wake up randomly in a different floor of the room oh, the floor wow. of the building and if they're at the top they get to feast if at the bottom they get to starve and it's about it becomes this really clever metaphor for social justice and communism and you know pulling together against the powers that be and there is this idea that if we could just all discipline ourselves to only take what we need we could fight back against the power structures that are punishing us but of course human beings don't behave like that and trauma and tragedy ensues but it's like it's balls to the wall crazy and it's violence in like you watch it kind of like whoa this is going where it's such a good film and i can't believe that the world isn't just like screaming about it so good yeah the platform everyone go and watch it and then tweet me with what you think of it because more people need to see this film um two books i want to shout out because they're the best books i've read this year it's as simple as that and they have very similar titles so bear with me one is a book called the last thing to burn by will dean uh, and that is a book that is kind of like misery and then it's about a man who is keeping a woman in a farmhouse and she can't escape. And I will say no more about it apart from it's incredibly tense. It's chilling. It's very concise and to the point. Um, nothing like the stuff that Will Dean normally writes. He writes Stephen King's small town thrillers. And this is something totally different. Um, the last thing to burn. It's a masterpiece. It's horror adjacent rather than horror. But it's so good. Um, the other book. Again, similar title. It's called Last One at the Party by Bethany Clift. And that is, um, it's a book about the end of the world, about a pandemic, which is great to read right now, <laughs> um, in which a woman is the only survivor of this disease called 6DM, six days maximum. It's how long you've got once you get it. Oh, wow. And she, she's not a hero. She's this, it's set in, the, in Britain, and she's just like a normal like person she's a, bit, a little bit lazy a little bit kind of like selfish a little bit you know everything she's not a hero at all um and she has to survive in this apocalyptic scenario just her and her dog well and and the, the cool thing about the book is when you look at the front cover of it it looks like a piece of kind of really fluffy chiclet it's designed that way it looks like something from sex in the city or something like that it's all pink and sparkly uh and it's the most horrifying book I've read all year. There are, wow. there are, and and even Beth, the author who I spoke to, didn't seem aware that her book was that horrifying. I have a bit of a thing about like animal suffering, and there's lots of scenes of that in the book. There's one scene in a zoo with some chimpanzees, which I have shouted at Beth for on Twitter for weeks now. It's <laughs> it's it's so traumatic, and I just got my my little puppy. Um, sort of very recently to reading it and i there's a, a, a scene with her dog um and when i read it i sat up in bed looked at my puppy and burst into tears so yeah last thing to burn by will dean last one at the party by bethany clift uh, they're both now recently been published in the us and north america and they're books that real horror fans it may not fall inside your circle of influence so so make sure you, you check them out. They're amazing. 
Um, and have I, have, have I got time for one more thing? Sorry, without sure. being too self-indulgent. So this is this is not a recent thing, but it's a thing I want to shout about to American listeners because you may not be aware of it. And it, it's a podcast and it's called The Parapod, as in like paranormal, but The Parapod. And it's it's horror adjacent. Cause it's about the paranormal. I think it's the funniest thing I've experienced in any medium or any media in years. The premise is very simple. It's two British guys um, with very thick accents like my own who sit down every week. One of them believes in ghosts. The other one is an ardent sceptic. They're both um, professional comedians, so they're naturally funny. But the one who believes in ghosts is a certifiable lunatic, from what I can tell. Uh, and the one who doesn't believe... The, the one who doesn't believe is just a bully. And it's basically <laughs> them having a conversation for an hour each week where they just shout at each other and ridicule each other whilst telling ghost stories. And it's the three series. And the more you listen, the more it becomes a bit of a community. It's, it's just endless in jokes. And they've now made a film that got delayed due to the pandemic. But that's coming out soon on kind of VOD. Um, the Parapod. Everyone listen to it because you will fall in love with these people. It's so good. Well, that sounds funny. Yeah, it's great. It's my favourite thing. It makes me laugh like when I'm in the worst mood. <laughs> I love shows like that, especially, uh, yeah, ones that foster a sense of community. And by the time you've listened to a few episodes, you're in on all the inside jokes. Oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. And it's really kind of adult, the humour as well. So like it, it gets quite cringy at times. It's And as a British person, it's so authentically northern, like it's exactly in my sense of humour. So if you want a window into the way we in the north are and the way we think about things like ghosts, then that there is no better uh, conduit into our mind. <laughs> All right. I will have to check that out. And... A new tradition on Books in the Freezer is to ask our guests what their final girl song would be. Okay, so first of all, does it need to be a song by or about a woman? No. Okay, I wonder what it was kind of like, you know, about a girl or that there was a theme or something like that. Okay, so I have the whitest music taste imaginable. Um, and my my suggestion is a song called decoration day by the singer songwriter jason isbell he, he he performed it as part of his band the, the drive-by truckers now he's gone solo he's a big deal uh decoration day which is it's a hard-boiled horror story in itself it's a kind of hatfield and mccoy's narrative about two warring um clans two families if you made it as a film it would be a horror story um it's got a line Thick lyrics like, I don't know the name of the boy we tied down and beat till he just couldn't walk anymore. Okay. I mean, it's like a Joel Lansdale novel set to music. Um, but nothing in it specifies the narrator is male. And I like to think that if they made, made a film out of it, it would it would um, feature a really, really badass woman played by Juliette Lewis. So, yeah, <laughs> Decoration Day by Jason Isbell. I am going to have to listen to that the minute we stop recording. <laughs> I will add it to the Spotify list. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. No, thank you. It's been lovely to be on the other side of the uh, recording <laughs> depth for once and not having to do the buttons and worrying about the uh, the Wi-Fi signal. So, so thank you. And I've got some great books to go away and read if I can find the time. <laughs> I feel you on that. So where can people find you online? Um, right, so, right, it's annoying this. So on Instagram, I am talking underscore scared underscore pod. You can email me at talking scared pod at gmail.com. And please do email me. I love getting emails. Patreon, which I'm desperate to get going in a big way, is also talking scared pod. So it's all talking scared pod apart from Twitter, which is my main kind of window on the world. And, I, and that t username is gone. So on Twitter, I am Talk Scared Pod, And that's where you'll find me most frequently. I live on Twitter. <laughs> all right. Well, we will link all of that so people can shout you out and listen to Talking Scared Pod. Listen to some good author interviews. Got some good ones coming up. I saw you have Carmen Maria Machado possibly, too. I do. And 
that's the first time I've realised I've been mispronouncing her name. So, yeah, I've got Cam Maria Machado. She's That's going to be June. Um, Joe Lansdale in June. Grady Hendrix, Chuck Wendig, um, Stephen Graham Jones, uh, Cassandra Core. Lots, lots and lots of cool people uh, coming soon. That's very exciting. So definitely check that out. And Neil, thanks so much for coming on today and talking with me about cults. Thank you very, very much. Remember, people, do not drink the Kool-Aid. Do not drink the Kool-Aid. It doesn't matter if you don't feel held by him. Don't join the cult. (laughs) Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on Twitter at Books Freezer Pod, on Instagram at Books in the Freezer, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Books in the Freezer. You can send us an email at Books in the Freezer at gmail.com. And we are now on TikTok at Books in the Freezer, just on TikTok. That is the username. If you would like to support the show, there are a few ways to do that. One of them is to support it on Patreon by becoming a Patreon supporter. There is a one, three, and a five dollar level with all kinds of bonuses at each level, ranging from, you know, early episode releases to bonus episode series to movie nights, boxer chats, all kinds of things. So check that out if that sounds interesting to you. Another way to support the podcast is to use the Amazon link that is in the show notes that takes you straight to Amazon. You just do your normal Amazon shopping like you would normally do, and we would get a small percentage of that purchase. And if you don't want to spend any money but still want to support the show, totally possible. Word of mouth is huge for small independent podcasts like this. So telling your friends about it, posting on social media, all of those things are very big and very helpful and thank you to all of you who do that and tag me in the posts i love to see it i'm stephanie you can find me on twitter at lady underscore gania that's l-a-d-y underscore g-a-g-n-o-n or on instagram at that's what she read and that is that's with two a's thank you for listening and see you next time on books in the freezer (laughs) 